So the GLP-1 drugs like Ozempic or semaglutide, terzepatide or Munjaro, these drugs are so hot. And there's so much talk about them, especially in the weight loss space, of course, diabetes space, also in the longevity space. But there's also been talk about these drugs for bone health. And I want you to understand there's a lot of nuance here. And I want to help translate some of these studies into the clinical data, because what we've seen in our practice is not really consistent with what I'm seeing in the literature. And I want to talk about the literature. I want to talk about our clinical expertise, because this is something that could really either boost or actually put a put the brakes on, on your bone health journey. So stick around. Again, we're going to go through the research. We're going to talk about whether or not it shows that they help bones, how they help bones, and then what we've seen in our practice, because we have not usually patients that we're prescribing it for, but patients that are on these drugs as they go through our program. And we've had enough of them now that I can share this with you. Okay, before I get into the evidence, before I get into the research, if you are finding value in this channel, do me a favor and click that subscribe button. The more people that subscribe, the more YouTube will push this out to people looking for bone health content. So if you could help me help others and serve our mission to educate the world that osteoporosis is reversible and preventable in the vast majority of people, all you gotta do is just click that subscribe button. So these drugs, Munjaro, Terzepatide, Semaglutide, Ozempic, Liraglutide, on and on and on. There are a bunch of them on the market. They have all been shown to have differing impacts on weight loss, insulin sensitivity, inflammation reduction. There's thoughts about all kinds of potential benefits, cognitive benefits, heart um, uh, heart risk, uh, heart attack risk, heart de disease development risk reduction, etc. In the longevity space, again, people are talking about this like everybody should be on them. But I want to review what the evidence is for bone specifically, because if that's your primary goal, we need to understand what this drug may be doing or what it may not be doing to your bones. All right, so as we get into the science, I want to start with some of the basics, because understanding the basics can help us to figure out how this could potentially work in humans, how it could be helpful or how it may not be helpful. So I pulled a couple of mouse models. And so this first study here shows that in a what's called a femoral defect model, meaning they broke their bone, but in a femoral defect model that these drugs independently helped to improve healing compared to placebo. So that's kind of cool. The second study showed that the GLP-1s, when given to an, a menopause-induced mouse, that the trabecular bone Im improved, actually the trabecular bone itself improved on the GLP-1 drugs, although not the cortical bone. It's also over a very short window though. So Animal studies would suggest, hey, maybe there's something going on here that we should investigate in humans. So then let's look at the human studies because I've actually got four of them for you. So this first study is on healthy, normal weight young adults. And what they notice is that when you gave these participants the GLP-1s, their CTX went down. And we're going to talk about CTX, P1, and P. So just quick sidebar if you're not familiar with these things. So CTX is becoming the standard osteoclast or bone breakdown biomarker to measure. It's in all these studies, which is great. It is released into the blood when your osteoclasts are working on breaking down bone. So we can measure their function with CTX. P1 and P is the buildup marker. So this is released into the blood when your osteoblasts are laying down collagen to build up bone. So osteoblasts, P1 and P, osteoclasts, CTX, okay? So now in that last study, what it suggested is that when you give a normal weight, healthy young adults, GLP-1s, their CTX goes down, which is a good thing if you're looking for slowing down bone loss. Now, they didn't measure P1 and P, so we don't actually know what the comparison is to the bone building side, but at least it's talking about CTX. Okay, so this next study is on humans, women in particular, going through weight loss. So this is a, a study on 37 participants. So, you know, it's small, but it was, they were followed for 12 months. So this is pretty cool. So 12 month study, they reduced their calorie intake by 12% with the goal of losing weight. Their primary outcome was changes in bone mineral content. So not necessarily bone mineral density, but BMC. And again, bone turnover markers, CTX and P1 and P. Cool. So what they noticed on the bone mineral content is that it went down in the control group, so the people who didn't change their diet, four times faster than, than those on the GLP-1. Interesting. They also noticed that P1 and P went up for those on the GLP-1. So bone building went up and CTX was unchanged. So it's different than the last study, right? Where CTX went down. So CTX was unchanged, P1 and P went up and their bone mineral content 
was four times higher at the end of the study, or well, not four times higher, the loss was four times greater in the control, better way of saying that. So this study then would suggest that the GLP-1s could protect against bone loss while losing weight. Now, if that were true, that would be pretty cool, but let's not jump to conclusions. Now, this next study was a really short study, and, and what they did in this study is they used, again, humans, and they had them go through an oral glucose tolerance test. And if you're not familiar with what this test is, it's when you consume a very specific amount of basically sugar water and you see what happens to your blood glucose. But you can measure other stuff too, like insulin usually, or you can measure CTX and P1 and P like they did in this study, which I think is interesting. Now, they also infused them, not necessarily with the drugs, but with the GLP-1 hormone itself, as well as GIP. So this would be similar more to like terzepatide, Munjaro, which is has both of those mechanisms, uh, but they were just straight up infusing these uh, hormones, which is a way to do it. Not commercially, but it's a way to study it. And so what they noticed is that if you compare the CTX and P1MP to the control group, to the group that had the GLP-1 hormone infused, versus the GIP and GLP hormone infused, you could see dramatic differences. Now, what's interesting is that the CTX dropped in every group significantly following the OGTT, and I can't really explain why. But what's interesting is that the GLP and the GIP infusions made the CTX drop even more. So again, you can draw this conclusion to say, well, maybe in this scenario where glucose is rising and falling and then we're following it for a few days, the GLP-1s or the GIPs and GLPs together are going to have a protective effect on bone because again, CTX is a breakdown marker. So it is slowing down, it's putting the brakes on bone breakdown, which is kind of interesting. Additionally, they noted that P1 and P was unchanged. So now we have three different human studies that all show something different when it comes to bone turnover markers and the addition of GLPs. All right, I've got one more study and it's the best one that I wanna show you. But before I get there, if you're struggling to put together your own bone optimization program and you haven't been to our masterclass yet, please come to our masterclass totally free. We do it about every other week. I run it myself and we talk about the common myths and misconceptions that we see for people that are coming into our program. Uh, we will do that for about 30 to 45 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll do a Q&A for about 20 minutes. So it takes about an hour. I think it'll be a really good use of your time if you are trying to DIY bone health. So link for that in the description on YouTube. All right, now this last study is interesting because it's a meta-analysis of seven randomized control trials looking at bone turnover markers, bone mineral density, and GLP-1s. I had no idea this, there were this many studies on this topic. But here's what's interesting. The meta-analysis showed that there was no difference in bone mineral density. To be fair though, their inclusion criteria were, was as low as four weeks of exposure. So if a study lasted at least four weeks, it could be included. Four weeks obviously is not long enough to change bone mineral density with any type of intervention. So um, we don't know what would have happened over time. But interesting here, the CTX consistently went up with the addition of the GLP-1s, which again is opposite of what we've already said. The P1 and P was unchanged in these studies. All right, so the takeaway from the research here is that we have some studies showing that GLP-1s cause CTX to go up. Some say that it doesn't change at all. Some say that it goes down. Some say that it goes down a lot. P1 and P is mostly either unchanged or goes up a little bit. So when you look at that from a big picture perspective, we have no idea. We have no idea what happens. And this is the challenge when you look at bench studies, animal models, you cannot guarantee that, that what you see in those animal models or in, at the cell level is going to then translate into clinical data, clinically successful data, I should say, right? That's why we have to do clinical trials and we really need to do large scale clinical trials in order to really understand what's happening with these drugs for bone in the long term, even in the short term, like months, really. Because let me tell you my experience clinically. So we have not that many, I can probably think of maybe 10 patients out of our current, what we've served over 600. We have 300 active patients. Uh, we probably have 10 that are on a GLP-1 or terzepatide, the GLP and GIP version. And so what we've seen is that for the majority of these, with one exception I can think of, they they wanted to stay on the drug because there were people that had a history of obesity. They'd gone on a weight loss journey. They wanted to stay on the drug. Fine. So we built a program around that they're doing all the things, right? But what we've seen consistently is that those on GLP-1s 
are not growing bone. Their bone turnover markers don't look great. They're not growing bone. So now I have a much different language around if someone wants to stay on these drugs or not. I think there is a way to do it. And I'll tell you about a patient I saw this week. So she was, uh, this was her six month follow up. So we don't have repeat imaging yet, but all of her biomarkers look amazing. But here's the difference. So she's on a very low dose. So if you think of the starting dose, that two and a half milligram dose of terzepatide, she's on an even lower dose than that. It works great for her. It just helps her. She's lost a, a bunch of weight, wants to keep it off. So for her, it just helps her with what she describes as the food noise, helps her to not overeat, and has really helped with her metabolic health. So her, her uh, glucose, her A1C, her insulin levels all look great. So she really wants to stay on this drug. Okay, fine. I told her my experience. She said, look, I will track my protein and eat adequate protein. I will do resistance training at least three days, if not five days a week. I will make sure I am getting enough calories. I will make sure I'm getting great sleep. I'll make sure I'll monitor my stress. On and on and on and on and on. She is like, this is provoking her to nail the program from a lifestyle perspective. And she absolutely is. And her bone turnover markers look great. Her, um, uh, all of her other biomarkers look great. So I think she's going to see improvement in bone mineral density. I do. We won't know this for another several months, but the GLP ones make it harder to eat adequate protein, especially if you're on the traditional dosing, right? You dose it up as high as you can. It's hard to eat protein and dietary fat. If you can't get protein in, if you can't get the building blocks of bone in, you're not going to be able to build bone and you're not going to be able to protect your bone, especially in the long term. So my concern is, is that for people that are on these drugs, especially at a, at a traditional dosing model, it's going to be really hard to get adequate protein, adequate nutrients. We're going to see muscle loss. We're going to see bone loss. And I think we're going to see it pretty consistently. So then what's the future of this? Well, I think that there is a role where potentially these drugs could be effective at doing something biochemically at the bone level. I don't really know what because the CTX and P1 and P are all over the place. So I think we need better studies to understand at what dose do we see what effect. So at what dose can we see a reduction in CTX, hopefully? At what dose could we potentially see an increase in P1 and P? And at what drug? Terzepatide is going to probably respond differently than semaglutide. So I look forward to seeing more research. I would love to see research looking at the microdosing concept. So again, take terzepatide, for example. Two and a half milligrams is the commercial starting dose. What if you started it at that or under that? What if you had half that or a 10th of that? If you go with these tiny, tiny doses, are you going to have that negative impact on protein consumption as you would at the commercial dose after you ramp it up? Remember that 15 milligrams is the max dose compared to that two and a half milligram starting dose for terzepatide. So if you can use the lowest effective dose and eat adequate protein, do resistance training, optimize hormones, all the things, could they have potential benefit what is that benefit over just doing those things alone? We just don't know yet. So new drugs are exciting. I get it. We would all love to have the, the hero riding in on a white horse and they're going to rescue us and we're no longer going to have osteoporosis. But the truth is nobody's coming to save you. So that guy on the white horse or that girl on the white horse is not coming and this drug is not it. So we have to do all the things. We have to build our own program. We have to be advocates for ourselves. We have to do the things that we know are going to be helpful for our bones. Because remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but a decision to reverse it is the beginning. I'll see you in the next video.